Hello, you're watching the Tomorrow's World Now uh, broadcast. We talk about news, prophecy, and your life. We're answering big questions with real answers. And today's program, we're going to be looking into some, some powerful topics. Uh, but first, I want to say that we've been away uh, for the past week and a half. Have you seen some of the uh, placements we've had for the Tomorrow's World Now? Uh, mentioning the Feast of Trumpets, mentioning the Day of Atonement, mentioning the Feast of Tabernacles that we've been keeping. And it has been wonderful. Uh, my family and I have been away keeping that. We've been in Hilton Head, South Carolina during that time. And we'll be talking about the Feast of Tabernacles a little bit later uh, in the program and what that pictures, what that time is looking forward to. Uh, for today's show, though, we're going to be discussing the Four Horsemen and their final ride, their intensified ride. We're going to be discussing the hope that comes after the Four Horsemen ride uh, and the seals of Revelation are opened, and we're looking forward to that time. Today, uh, we've got with us uh, Dr. Scott Winnell. He's the Vice President of Living University, and uh, Living University is our online university that uh, he's a, a, a professor there, and again, Vice President. And we have our festival site planner, again, for the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, Mr. Jim Meredith, uh, also hey, a minister in the in the Church of God, and Living Church of God. Um, so again, our, our topics that we're going to be getting into, again, is the seal of Revelation, seals of Revelation, first four seals and the horsemen associated with them, and also the hope that's coming in the future, the hope of Jesus Christ's return and what that uh, Feast of Tabernacles that we were just all keeping uh, pictured. And again, if you haven't, uh, we'd ask you for this show, please like and share on Facebook or YouTube or wherever you're watching. We really appreciate that. And honestly, that's your part to preach this gospel of the kingdom of God. And that's, that's what we're here to do, and that's what we're doing right now. So I did want to ask, uh, just uh, generally speaking, how was you all's feast? How was your feast, Dr. Scott? Thanks, Mike. Oh, we had a wonderful feast. My family and I had the opportunity this year. We were stateside, but we had the opportunity to be in Alaska for the feast in Anchorage. Uh, gorgeous area of the country, spectacular in beauty, and really great fellowship with God's people, powerful spiritual messages. Hmm. Very good. And you? I was asked to go to Snowmass, Colorado. I know it's a tough place to go, but somebody had to go <laughs> oh. there up in the beautiful Rocky Mountains. Uh, Snowmass is a beautiful little quiet ski village this time of year because, of course, there's no skiing and and all, but it was truly a beautiful place to be able to rejoice before God and learn to fear Him and keep His feast. And uh, we had a lot of people there that were just uh, really having a wonderful festival, and uh, you know, just had nothing but good things to say about it. So, that's that's great awesome. place. That's great. That's great. So again, uh, talking about the first four seals of Revelation and the horsemen associated with them. So I want to get started. We're going to look at, we're going to read through some scriptures today. Um, so if you have your Bible, you can get your Bible out and prove what we're saying is, is right and true. Uh, so first, we'll start out with the first horseman that's talked about in Revelation 6. Revelation 6 and verses 1 and 2. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see, showing this seal being opened. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. And to, give, to help give us some context, we're going to go to Matthew 24 and verse, uh, verses 4 and 5. Matthew 24 and verses 4 and 5. So what is this talking about? Many times... People have gotten this confused, thinking this is talking about Jesus Christ, whereas we'll see that it is not talking about Jesus Christ. And we, In fact, uh, Mr. Wally Smith just did a, a program that you can watch that on the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You can watch that. But Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5, when he was asked in verse 3 by his disciples, what is going to be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. Talking about the end of the age. Not, not uh, even his time, but the end of the age. Matthew 24 and verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, 
and will deceive many. So this, this first horseman riding on a white horse is talking about the, uh, the, uh, the false prophet, false Christianity in general. Uh, so how do we know that that's the case? How do we know that this is not talking about Jesus Christ? Well, actually, I wanted to insert, and you might want to comment on this in a minute, uh, Mr. Meredith, but I wanted to insert real quickly, it's interesting that Jesus Christ made the observation here uh, when he was asked, what are the signs at the end of the age? And Christ didn't answer, well, don't worry about the end of the age. Don't worry about prophecy. It'll take care of itself. You really just need to worry on about the Beatitudes and these other things. Um, not taking anything away from his other teachings, but he actually took the time here to say, here are the signs. This is how you can tell. Watch what is going to happen. You're going to see this and this and this and this. So I think it's important to recognize that it was Christ himself who was emphasizing the importance of watching, and he goes on later in the chapter to say that. Boy, sure, great point there. Yes. How, how do we know that this is not... Uh, uh, how, do you know, how do we know he was talking about uh, the future, this seal, basically, and that this, is not, this seal does not represent Jesus Christ? Well, Jesus Christ, as, as we read later in Revelation, is also going to return on a white horse. But it isn't about the white horse there that, that, is, that is the key. The key is the deception of it being on a white horse. We live in a world today that is highly and entirely deceived. We have a form of Christianity that does not follow the Christianity of the Bible. And that's the reality of it. And most people don't want to hear that. They, they think that what they're doing is fine and good. But we really do live in a world that has totally been deceived, even at this point, but it's going to continue to get worse and worse. And this final false prophet that's going to come and deceive the whole world and, and all is going to be a much more powerful force than we currently see. But we see the gentle deceptions, going back to the old analogy of the frog in the pan of water, mm -hmm. that you just sit there and slowly you simmer and, and you, you don't realize it's getting hotter and hotter. You don't realize the changes that are happening around you because you just slowly become accustomed to them. Sure. And when we look at what the Bible says and how God says to obey Him, and we look at the state of the world that we're in right now, and we look at this nation in particular, when I think of the United States of America, it's happening all over the world. But in this country, if I go back 20 or 30 years ago, and I see the way this nation was and how people felt about certain issues that today are hot topic issues, you don't want to, you don't want to go against the LGBT movement because that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. that, don't be a hater. Mm -hmm. And that's what Satan wants. But yet, when you read what God's Word says and talks about that lifestyle, and it isn't just about being gay or lesbian, it, it's look at the men and women that are living together in this country. Divorce rates are going down. Why? Because people aren't getting married anymore. But God says, if you, you, know, if you have an, a, a, you know, a relationship with a woman or a man and you're not married, that's a sin, just as much as any of these other things are. But yet, it's totally acceptable in society. And Even if you try Christianity to, if you try to say to anything accept. about it, they just try to tear you down like you're some kind of a hater, as I said. Mm -hmm. your, your comment about how there's this deception in this horse, mm -hmm. I think, is important to, to hone in on. Mm -hmm. uh, when we let the Bible interpret itself, it helps us understand even more. And so Matthew, as you read in Matthew 24, Christ starts out with these descriptors. And if we, if we map Matthew 24, those first several verses on top of Revelation 6, we see, wait a second, he, this is the same right. points. It gives clarity to Re Revelation 6. So he's, he's talking about false prophets. Uh, if, if we look to it at Revelation 19, we see Christ coming back not with a bow, but we see him coming back with a sword in his hand. Right. Um, he's not coming back to conquer or to, to take that. He's coming back to set up his kingdom on the earth mm -hmm. in that sense. We can look back in history and we can see a church, a world church, who did use a bow right. and other mechanisms over time to enforce their belief and system. And came conquering and to conquer in that way, right? A human organization, and apparently we're going to see that again. Mm -hmm. I think about Revelation 11 verse, I'm sorry, chapter 13 verse 11, it says, I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he said, uh, and he had two horns like a lamb, he looked like a lamb, and spoke like a dragon. You know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
Uh, so the, talking about a false Christianity, a false prophet, a false uh, religion. Um, and, and further on in that chapter, uh, he goes on to talk about how this individual is going to do signs and wonders and uh, Second Thessalonians 2 talks about calling down fire from heaven to deceive people, right. but to do it in the name of Jesus Christ. And ultimately, this individual is going to set himself up as Christ. Right, and, and just because someone calls down fire from heaven or does incredible miracles, does that mean that they're a, a true prophet of God? Absolutely not. I mean, you look back at the biblical example in the Old Testament of uh, Moses when he went before Pharaoh and he threw down his his rod and it became a serpent. Well, what did Pharaoh's you know sorcerers do? They threw their rods down and they became serpent, so, uh, serpents. So does that mean that they were all men of God? Well, I think we realize they weren't. Obviously, Pharaoh's you know people and his nation were not a godly nation. They didn't even know God, the true God. And so just because somebody does some kind of a miracle like that doesn't necessarily make them a man of God. Right. It's about the message they bring. Mm -hmm. It's about what they say and what they preach. And unfortunately, talking about the deceptions going on in this world, the, the message that people are preaching does not follow what God's Bible says. It's against they, they, His Word. It is against it. It's absolutely against it. And they're contrary to God, and they're contrary to what He says when they start preaching these other things of that are that don't follow what God's word said. Sure, to and, the law and to the testimony is what it says in Isaiah uh, yeah. eight. Yeah, and and once again, you you look at the the deception that's out there, and you see what Jesus Christ Himself said when He said, you know, if you love me, keep my commandments. And he, he wasn't talking about just some few words that he spoke there that are recorded in Matthew. He's talking about the commandments that he gave that are given back in Gen or, or Exodus chapter 20, and the commandments that he gave all through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Those were his commandments. He was the one that gave those. And yet modern Christianity, mm -hmm. quote-unquote, has done away with that and says, oh, it was all nailed to the cross. Right. And Jesus said just the opposite. He said, keep my commandments if you love me. Mm -hmm. And they're like, we don't need to, because he nailed them to the cross. Right. And Jesus himself once again said, I did not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill it, to, to bring it to the full, which he did. So Jesus talked about the, the false prophets, the false Christianity that, that would come in the end. This Revelation 6, verses 1 and 2 is talking about that time, that end time, and the things that Christ was warning to look for. That's what he was talking about. Well, we've got a lot of uh, uh, ground to cover today. Uh, if you're just joining us, uh, we're here for tomorrow's world. We're talking about the four horsemen of the apocalypse and then the hope that comes afterwards, the incredible future that God and Jesus Christ have ready for us. Uh, that's what we're talking about today. And we just talked about the false Christianity. Uh, so for our next, uh, uh, the next seal, the next horseman that uh, will ride, is talked about, again, in Revelation 6. You can get your, your Bible, you can read, make sure that what we're saying is true, and you can read it in Revelation 6 and verse 3, the second seal that's open. It says, When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. And another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. Talking about wars, talking about future wars, and, and just in general speaking about wars. Uh, let's go to Matthew 24 to help give perspective. Like Dr. Scott, like you mentioned, that Matthew 24, when, when meshed with Revelation 6, it gives clarity that you don't have... Uh, from Revelation 6 alone. It gives that clarity. Matthew 24 uh, just talked about the false prophets Jesus Christ did and answering what will happen at the end of the age. And it says in verse 6, And you will hear wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And he says in verse 7, For nation will rise against nation, 
and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be, and then it can, he continues. So nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Um, the significance of these words, gentlemen. Well, obviously, we've seen war in the world for ever, so to speak. There's always been warring going on and fighting and, and, and you know, man, one man against another. And so what makes this any different? Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, Jesus doesn't get into any specifics of what is going to happen. We've seen a first world war and a second world war, and we're talking about a third world war, especially now with what's going on in North Korea right. and Kim Jong-un. You know, is, is he going to be the true rocket man and fire something off and start something? I don't believe that this is that time, and he may do something foolish. We don't know, but that's not the point here. The point is that we're going to continue to see these things, but at the time of the very end before Christ returns and we get into that time period in the Great Tribulation, we're going to see wars escalating in a, in a way that we've never really seen before. We have lots of skirmishes and, and infighting and that sort of thing, but it's going to be on a whole bigger level, so to speak. I don't, I don't know what your comments on this. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, just this last week, um, the German foreign minister, I'm, I'm reading from Reuters here, October 14, says, if the United States terminates the Iran nuclear deal or reimposes sanctions on Tehran, it could result in Iran developing nuclear weapons and raise the danger of war close to Europe, mm. uh, German's foreign minister said on Sunday or on Saturday. So here you've got a situation that the world has really been trying to deal with in Iran, yet here's the foreign minister saying if the U.S. pulls out, it, it, because Iran is threatening, they're going to go ahead and do their own thing. If they do that, if you read down through the article, they're talking about maybe a nuclear escalation within the Middle East and nations vying for nuclear weapons over there, mm. right on the borders of Europe in a sense. And so the, the, the level of threat from these conflicts is much greater. There's a lot more at stake than there has been historically, as you're pointing out. Sure. It and you're talking us, nuclear weapons, you're talking about mass destruction. Right, mass destruction. It puts us on the brink of extinction is what it does. I mean, it, it, dangerous, dangerous. Potentially. Um, I wanted to jump in, too. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's helpful to go back into the Greek or the Hebrew mm-hmm. from the original. Uh, we, we don't want to do that too much because it can bog us down, but... Sometimes when we take a translation, remember uh, Jesus Christ and the apostles didn't speak and or write in English uh, or in Spanish or in French, whatever Bible you're reading, they they did it in Greek. And so the original Greek here, uh, nation will rise up against nation. We've talked about this before. The word for nation is ethnos. It's the word we use, we get ethnic, our, our background. So it's actually different kinds of people against different kinds of people, versus when you read against kingdom against kingdom, that's really talking about um, what we would call nations Mm -hmm. today, uh, kingdoms, um, governments against governments. It's a bigger conflict. So the concept of nation against nation, you're you're talking about ethnic groups rising against ethnic groups, and more of this Mm -hmm. as we go down to the end of the age. We see the conflicts in Sudan. Uh, They're against ethnic groups. It's ethnic groups fighting. We see conflict in Yemen. It's it's ethnic groups. It's different kinds of people. We see conflicts in Egypt or Libya. They're different. Iraq. It's been going on for decades Mm -hmm. in Iraq with the Sunnis and the uh, Shiites. Shiites. Yeah, and And, and the Kurds and and the Arabs. Right. So... Apparently, we're going to see not only the, the escalation of the big kinds of wars coming, or the, the big war, World War III, as even the popular press is talking about, but more of these ethnic conflicts that sure. are tearing the fabrics of societies apart. Sure. Boy, uh, there's a, an article that uh, we might be able to put on the screen showing a map of, uh, it's produced by the Daily News, um, and or, I'm sorry, Daily Mail. And it just shows all of the conflicts happening right now. The article says that over 40 conflicts are taking place right now um, around the world. I mean, it's just a, a time, and as we see from this seal, that it's going to get worse. We're looking; People are looking for a time 
when when it's going to stop. The the UN is there to 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 cause world peace or at least to to uh, mitigate some of the damage that war causes and that uh, conflicts can can cause. But it's not going to happen as we see until the return of Jesus Christ. That will again we'll talk about that. But this seal pictures time as we get closer to the end and these uh, four horsemen intensify their ride when these seals are open it will only get worse is what god's word tells us and it's it's sad and it's hurtful but that is what is going to happen um, just again covering these topics uh, uh, relatively quickly because we have a lot to talk about. We want to spend some time on the coming kingdom of God and the millennium, uh, that thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. We want to talk about that uh, and get and talk about these um, uh, seals. So the second seal we just talked about is wars and rumors of wars. And if, again, if you're just joining us, we're talking about the four seals and the four horsemen that, associ that are associated with them. And we, we're also going to talk about the coming kingdom of God, the time of hope that's after all of this, uh, this mess and the hurt that comes with these uh, seals being open. And so we're, that's what we're going to be talking about. And a reminder, if you haven't already, please like us on Facebook and YouTube. And also uh, sh remember to share as well. Remember to share this show. So the third seal we're going to be talking about in Revelation 6 again. We're going to turn to Revelation 6 and kind of get some context for the third seal and the third horseman. <clears throat> Revelation 6 and verse 5 says, when he opened the third seal, I heard a third living creature say, come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of four living creatures, of the four living creatures, saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the wine and the oil. This is talking about famine. This is talking about scarcity of food uh, to a degree that the, the world hasn't seen yet. And in Matthew 24, bringing uh, out again, uh, letting God's word interpret God's word. Matthew 24, Jesus Christ himself speaking about the things that would happen in the end. Verse 7, he just talked about nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Then he says, there will be famines. And he continues with pestilence and so forth. But there will be famines. That is the, the next seal that will be open and the, the third horseman that will rhyme. Um, we just had, had uh, which I didn't even know about, but uh, of course, you, I think you sent an article out that said that uh, on October 16th, I think it was, was World Food Day. Um, you know, didn't know about it. We're here in, in the U.S. and not, maybe not thinking about some of those things the way we, uh, we could or should. Um, but it recognizes global food problems, and it also looks at some of the accomplishments over the years. Um, uh, what are some of the, the challenges of, of uh, starvation and hunger in the world today? Well, in the world today, we live in the United States of America where we have been given the blessings of Abraham. Mm -hmm. And in spite of the fact of all the blessings we have, I think we all know that there is a big homeless population out there mm -hmm. who is hungry, but it doesn't really compare to what we see on a world scale. Mm -hmm. uh, I got an article here from World Health Organization talking about world hunger being on the rise, and it says that currently for uh, that it, the the uh, you know hunger has been declining over the last decade, but it currently is affecting 815 million people in two hundred in 2016, which is an 11 percent rise over the previous year. So, from the standpoint of you look at those numbers, the, the numbers are big: 815 million people. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's roughly 10% of the population of the world. Mm -hmm. That's the population of the United States and probably most of Europe combined that are that are starving. And this isn't just that they missed a meal or something. Right. 
they are starving to death because they don't have the nutrition they need. And I'm sure all of us have seen the programs from World Vision and the other places that put out and show these countries in Africa and in places like Ethiopia and, and other places where they're, they're skin and bones. Mm. And these children are born that never have a chance at life. Mm. And it's, it's a horrible situation even now. But to think that it's only going to get worse should really put the fear of God into us. Sure. It's really out what it's all about, is when we see that this is going to be a predominant thing, it's going to change the whole landscape of the way mankind lives. You know, if it's one in nine people, as I think roughly where that comes, you know, that, that uh, 815 million, and, and the same article says that 38 more million are going to be added to that in, in 2017, I think is what the article said. Right. We're talking... Uh, you know, one in nine, how, how bad is it going to get? Well, and I think that's, that's the real question. If there's almost a billion people today and it's going to get worse, that should really move us to, to, to think deeply and recognize, wait a second, something's wrong here. There are reasons why God is allowing this, but mankind is, we're bringing this on ourselves. One of the things you note about hunger, and famine in particular, is it often comes on the heels or it does come on the heels of war. And so you've got this previous plague that we just read about, wars and, in, and rumors of wars increasing all over the world, you're going to have increases in famine that follow it sure. because of the war, because of the decisions that mankind is making to focus on self and to ignore really their people. And to destroy the land, right. the people are the ones who are reaping the consequences of it, and it's really sad. Which I'll tell you, I think that uh, may help answer a question that we just uh, got on YouTube. The question is, uh, does Satan use humans to administer the famines uh, and false religion and wars, or do the demons make these things happen without human hands supernaturally? Mm. And uh, I think you you help to answer that question. I yes. mean, th th this, is, this is mankind's doing in many ways, oh, refusing we've, 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 to obey God. We have brought God. all of these things on ourselves. Right. Now, obviously, ultimately, Satan is the one that has inspired sure. it to happen, and you know he has deceived the whole world sure. and, and all. But the reality of it is, yes, mankind has done this to himself. If you don't go out and plant fields and vineyards and reap them, you're going to starve to death. If you go to war and you fight... You're going to have death, you're going to have pestilence, That's right. you're going to have disease and all sorts of things. Yes, it hurts. It's going to hurt. Uh, from one of the articles, uh, uh, actually, DW.com, um, may, you may have referenced this uh, just a minute ago, but uh, uh, entitled, UN Number of Starving Has Increased, and it says, uh, it talked about the number of people that are starving or suffering from hunger. And it says the first step, the first step, the w, WFP, that is the World Food Program, says is tackling to, to handle all of this, to fix this problem. The first step is tackling a handful of the man made root causes of hunger, and that is conflict, just like you said. Mankind's own doing. That, uh, that has caused these problems. Well, it's ultimately unrighteous government. Sure. It's, it's people getting in to power positions and, and feeding themselves, as some of the Scripture talks about, ignoring the people, not caring, um, going to war to hold on to their own power in most cases or to extend their power, and you wind up with all of this suffering. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're uh, just joining us, uh, again, we're talking about the four horsemen and the four seals that Revelation 6 discusses, and we're looking, we're looking at those and then going to be looking at the coming kingdom of God that will fix the problems that we're talking about that, that really is the hope that we're looking forward to. Um, and again, if you haven't already, please like us or share us on Facebook and YouTube. We appreciate that. You can also send any questions you have. Uh, we'd appreciate that as well. Uh, the fourth, we're now on the fourth seal, the fourth seal being open, talking about the fourth horseman to ride. And that we're reading from Revelation 6 and now verse 7. Revelation 6, verse 7, about the fourth seal. When he opened the fourth seal... I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, 
and Hades followed him. The grave followed him. And power was given to them over, the, over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. And of course, uh, Matthew 24 also, again, highlights some of that. I'm just going to read from that. Matthew 24, uh, continuing in verse 7, as we're meshing the two, putting the two together to help give clarity uh, that may not otherwise be there. And he talked about there will be famines, verse 7, the end, last part of verse 7, pestilence and earthquakes in various places. So this pestilence, this disease, and, and as it talks about with the sword and so forth, people dying, a fourth of the earth, a fourth of the earth population. Um, you know, w was it even possible for, for this to have happened, you know, in Christ's day? <laughs> Not at all. I mean, you could kill people with swords and spears and uh, maybe poison the water supply of a, of a city, but you can't knock out billions of people. There weren't even that many people at that time. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, you know, when we look at the sheer numbers involved, and obviously knowing this is going to happen down the road, and, you know, 25% of the people are going to die, that's billions of people. Mm. And there, there's no way for mankind to even cope with handling and bearing. And so that in itself, as we talked about all of these other things that are going to lead up to this, um, you know, the, the diseases and, and pestilence and that sort of thing is going to be as a result of, of all these dead and rotting bodies from the wars and from the uh, famines, famines right. and everything else. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we see a world that, that, from looking at man's standpoint right now, is on the edge of extinction, quote-unquote. And this is, as I forget what movie it was, it talked about an extinction-level event. But fortunately, Bruce Willis is going to save the day, and he's going to come back. No. <laughs> no, that, that's the whole point, is man cannot save himself. It is only going to happen if, if God intervenes. And, um, you know, man is looking for a reason. Man is wanting to understand, but until God opens his eyes, it's not going to happen. Mm. And so as, as we think about an extinction-level event like this, um, only God can, in essence, turn things around because things are going to get so bad that, uh, as as I believe you read earlier over here in Matthew 24, that in verse 22, that it, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, he says, those days will be shortened. Mm. And the elect are those of who, whom God has called and chosen. And they're still going to be, you know, those of us who love God, who obey God, who are going to live according to His commandments and live a godly way of life, and God is going to save mankind for the elect's sake is what Jesus says right here. And once again, we got to remember, this is Jesus Christ saying this. This wasn't somebody else. Right. This was the man himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, so we have to realize that those days are going to be shortened and, and all, but it's going to be a terrible time before that. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I'm, I was listening to you talk, and some could accuse you of being hyperbolous and, and fanciful. Oh, you're just talking about all these terrible things, and the, the world is going to become almost extinct. But as you just read, those are Christ's very words. I didn't, I didn't make that up. I didn't write that. Mm -hmm. I'm just reading what he said. And he, it, it, he's able to say that because he knows mankind. And he knows human nature. And he knows, as actually one of the people who just wrote in mentioned, there is a Satan, the devil, who is called the god of this world and also the prince of the power of the air. He is the one who broadcasts and intensifies these feelings that we have that motivate us to do wrong. Uh, it's the heart of man is desperately wicked, as Jeremiah um, seventeen nine says. And under man's own influence, this is where it's going to lead. That's where it leads. And, you know, it, talking later in Revelation, this makes me think about, think about this. Later in Revelation, talking about the, the, four, the seven bowls that are poured out in Revelation 16, this is, you know, this is God's, it says the completion of his wrath is happening uh, in, in chapter 15 and verse 
1. Mm -hmm. uh, but in chapter 16, verse 9, talking about one of these bowls that's poured out, and it says, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed. Well, this is after all of this has happened. Mm -hmm. Mankind's attitude toward, toward their creator, the one who does love them, the one who allowed his son to be sacrificed for us because of his love for us. And mankind wants to go against that. They blaspheme the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. And it says that for several of those mm -hmm. as yeah. well. I mean, just power. Well, well, I mean, what you brought up there, you skipped ahead of the story. We're just at the beginning of the story here mm -hmm. with the four That's horsemen right. of the That's apocalypse. Right. Very beginning. That's There's right. There's seven beginning seals. At the end. Seven seals followed by seven trumpets followed by the seven bowls of God's wrath. Right. There's a whole lot more death, destruction, and devastation that's going to happen. That's right. Even after these four horsemen. Some people, I think, don't realize that the fourth horseman isn't the end of the story. It that's right. goes way beyond that. Way beyond that. And, you know, once again, unless Christ cuts those days short, no, no flesh would be saved alive. Which I, I think is a great segue into the next uh, topic we're going to be discussing. And again, if you're just joining us, we're talking about the four horsemen and the, the seals of Revelation 6. And But now we've talked about the first four horsemen, the false Christianity. We've talked about rumor wars and rumors of wars. We've talked about famine. We've talked about uh, mankind almost going extinct. And the, the topic, the fifth topic we want to talk about and focus on right now is the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. You know, you mentioned that this is just the beginning uh, of the, the problems we're talking about. These first four horsemen is just the beginning, because you're right, then the, the remainder of the seals that are to be opened, and the last year, right before Jesus Christ returns, that is the, the seven trumpets that will be blown. And of course, again, we've been the the keeping Lord. the Day of the Lord, and we've been keeping the Feast of Tabernacles, but before that we had the Feast of Trumpets. It is a time looking forward, picturing that time. Where of course, with this, at the seventh trumpet, that's when Jesus Christ returns, but that's where doing what God says in His Word, there can be an understanding of, of why there's so much trouble, why all of this is happening. God's holy days give us that. Um, can you explain the Feast of Trumpets and then the Day of Atonement, what those picture before we get into the Feast of Tabernacles? <clears throat> well, you mentioned the Feast of Trumpets really points us to that Day of the Lord, the final year prior to Christ's return. Uh, terrible things are going to happen, but at the end of it, Christ descends from heaven. Uh, as lightning, he returns, and there's a resurrection of the saints that takes place. Following that, you have... Uh, the Day of Atonement, which points to actually the binding of Satan, the devil, the god of this age, and his minions, his demons, so they can deceive the nations no more for a thousand years, Revelation 1, verses 1 through 3. And, and so you begin to enter this time then, after these world wars, after the destruction, after Christ's return, after Satan is gone, where Christ and the saints, mm -hmm. uh, Revelation 20 talks about this, Revelation 5.10 lets us know they're going to reign on the earth right. for a thousand years, they're not going to be up in heaven for an investigative judgment, they're going to be here mm -hmm. on the earth working with human beings during that time. What's exciting to me is that you've got God's annual holy days, as you're mentioning, that lay out the plan of God. It's amazing. It's, it's really sad. Worldly Christianity has been deceived into believing that the Old Testament is Old Covenant and thus nailed to the cross, mm -hmm. when in fact <laughs> the Old Testament was called by Paul and others Scripture. It is inspired for doctrine, and it, it lays out the holy days, lay out the plan of God, and if you know the holy days and you practice them, you look into the plan of God mm -hmm. and you look into what is coming which is what we're doing it's now. We're, the Feast of Tabernacles we just returned from was looking into this thousand-year period of, of peace on the earth, right. which the Bible is full of. The, the, much of the book of Isaiah, much of Jeremiah, some of the minor prophets really dig into the vision of this coming time when Christ and the saints rule the earth. Yeah, it's an awesome yeah. time. 
Uh, you know, you mentioned about Satan being bound on the Day of Atonement. I, I did want to read that out loud because this is exciting. I mean, really, right up to the to the return of Jesus Christ or after uh, Christ returns and Satan is bound, it says in Revelation 20 and verse 1, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit. This is after all of the things we've been talking about have happened. And a chain... Uh, and a chain in his hand, he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. So there will be this, this thousand year peaceful reign of Jesus Christ. Incredible future that, that we're looking forward to. That's what we were keeping. The Feast of Tabernacles looks forward to that time. Yeah, and, and I think that, that what you just read there, if you, if you think back through what we've been talking about here today and what you just read there, it sums up the first point and really what our last point is here, that, that first point being the deception of Satan. And ever since Adam and Eve were on earth and Eve was deceived by Satan, he started the ball rolling. And for the last roughly 6,000 years, mankind has been deceived by Satan. We don't want to admit that, but it's a reality. And we look at the state of the world and what it's been in, and the fighting and the death and the destruction and the misery and everything else over the last 6,000 years, it hasn't been a pretty picture. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously there's some good points in, in time, but there's been a lot of evil. And it started off with that, but now as we look at the fulfillment of what's ultimately going to happen, when Jesus Christ returns as King of kings and Lord of lords, and those who he resurrects at that seventh trump are going to also be kings underneath him. We're going to be ruling and helping to teach mankind. We're going to come into a pretty ugly place when Christ initially returns. This earth is going to be destroyed, but we're going to rebuild it, and we're going to make it better, so to speak. It's going to be like it was when God created the earth, which is something that you can't just fully comprehend how good it really was. I was just, as I said, up in Snowmass, Colorado for our festival there, up in the, high in the Rocky Mountains, a beautiful area of the world. The, the leaves were changing, and the yellow and the red leaves, we got six or eight inches of snow right before the feast, and so the, the mountains were snow-capped, and it was just millennial and peaceful. But yet, we were still in the world, and there still was things going on in the world that we knew weren't good. We get the news. I turn the TV on. You know, I get on the internet, and we see that we're still living in God's world. And we had just a little slice of that peace and that tranquility that's going to be here when Jesus Christ returns. And it was a beautiful thing. And being able to celebrate that each and every year is something that's just a really special part of our calling that we're, you know, I, I know from the time I, since I grew up in the church my whole life, every year looking forward to the feast and being able to go and celebrate the feast was a big deal. Right. And, uh, it's just something that I, I think that God gave us this as a special blessing for all of us. I just want to make a quick observation that what we're talking about is not a pipe dream. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, Daniel says the interpretation is true and the dream is certain in Daniel chapter 2. We have a booklet entitled Holy Days, God's Master Plan that if you want to find out more about the Holy Days themselves, you can read. But really, everything we're talking about today is, is, is scriptural. Right. <clears throat> we're not turning to all the scriptures. We're not referencing them. But there's a lot of material on our website. So if you're interested, you can get online. We have telecasts. We have articles. We have booklets that really help you delve into the details. I'll tell you, I, I, I want to get into it. I say let's get into a couple of scriptures. I'd like to do that. Yeah. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 2, Isaiah was inspired some 2,500 years ago to write this. He was inspired before the Israelites went into captivity to write this. And this is something that never happened. It's still yet to mm. take place. Isaiah chapter 2, this is probably one of our favorite scriptures. The fact that it's never happened, it, 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 it tells us it's something that still needs to yeah, take place. It, it has to take That's place. Right. God's prophecies don't fail. 
Um, but Isaiah 2, verse 2, it said, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days. This is talking about after the return of Christ. Uh, obviously not before, as you'll see. The mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains. And we understand from reading Scripture that a mountain literally can mean a physical mountain, but it also is representative of a kingdom. And so it's Christ's kingdom being established on top of the kingdoms of the world. That's why he's going to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. It shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. Many people shall come and say, this is verse 3, Come, let us go up to the uh, mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, for we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth, what? The law. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and then he goes on to talk about the peace, people beating swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks, no more war. But this idea here in verse 3 of, out of Zion shall go forth the law. What law? The law of God. Right, that causes peace, it causes happiness, it's God's ways that cause good things. James talks about it being the perfect law of liberty in James 1 verse 25. Mm -hmm. It's a law that liberates Right. When you think about it, when it's against God's law to steal, mm-hmm. when it's against God's law to kill, when it's against God's law to commit adultery, can we begin to think about how the world will change when, when stealing goes away, when killing goes away, when committing adultery goes away? Think about all of the other negative pieces of society then that begin to erode and, and dissipate. You know, you, you, you stopped at verse 3, but I do want to read, I want to read verse 4. I love verse 4. Uh, I had it in my notes, in fact. Um, it says, he shall judge between the nations, uh, just in the context of what you just read, he shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, a time of peace. There won't be the need of the swords, swords the way they were. And their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. What did Jesus Christ talk about? He talked about nation against nation. But mm-hmm. it won't be anymore. It will be gone. It will be stopped. That's the time that we're looking forward to. This is the time that, that God gives to us as a hope to look forward to, that, that we can be a part of. We can be a part of helping this. He says, Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. It will be done. They will be taught peace, the way of peace. What an exciting Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. And so we look at a time that is, that is going to be a tranquility. We, we talk about you know a millennium, but I don't think most people really understand what a millennium really is all about. And until you get in and you start reading the scriptures of, the, of, the, of God's description of what this millennial period are going to be, then you can suddenly begin to get a better feel for it. You know, the child is going gonna, is gonna to lie down next to the mm-hmm. adder's nest, and the, and the boy is going to walk with the lamb and the lion. Right. There's, there's going to be no more wild animals on earth. Isaiah you 11. Know? Yeah. Exactly. In, in fact, I've got my Bible open to that. wanted to, to read that out loud here, you know, talking about that that thousand-year period. It says, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the young goat, the the nature will be changed. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. There won't need to be the the fear the same way. They won't be, uh, they won't have, again, the same nature. Nothing to be afraid of. Right, there won't be anything to be afraid of. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. This is what. This is the time for humanity to have this peace that they've never had the opportunity to, to experience. And the wean child shall put his hand in the viper's den, and they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What a beautiful, incredible future that that Feast of Tabernacles, that that looks forward to. And, you know, you, even what you mentioned, some of that uh, getting into the last great day and the coming uh, great white throne judgment, just beautiful. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting that we started with the four horsemen, and it's, I think it's important. Uh, some people might say, well, that's doom and gloom. Mm. Well, it's reality. Mm-hmm. But when we can see a little bit of the detail of that doom and gloom reality, 
and then contrast that with what is coming after that. The doom and gloom is a result of man's attempts to try and bring peace to the world, something that's evaded him for 6,000 years. But when we read some of these scriptures, this is Jesus Christ coming back as the King of Kings, being accompanied by the saints, enforcing peace, if you will, bringing peace, not a sword, but bringing peace. And you see that incredible contrast. Isaiah 35 is one of my favorite millennial chapters that gives us more of a glimpse into this time. Verse 1, the wilderness and the waste lands. And we've got plenty of those today. We're going to have more of them as we've been just been talking about. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. We have massive deserts today. We will, they'll probably grow as famine grows. Yet there's a time coming when there's going to be so much abundance that you're not going to have all that sand anymore. You're going to have lushness and vegetation. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice. Even with joy and singing, and then skipping down to verse 3, strengthen the weak hands, make firm the feeble knees, say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear, behold, your God will come with vengeance, with recompense of God, he will come and save you. Verse 5, the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing, waters will burst forth in the wilderness. It's almost like the world is just waiting to be freed. And Romans probably won't go there. Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 22 talk about this, where the earth is laboring in travail now, in agony, waiting for the time of the revealing of the children of God, mm -hmm. when, when finally, if you will, peace will break out. Right. That is one of my favorite sections of Scripture there, Romans 8, the latter part there. Just beautiful talking about that future time. It's, it's groaning, it's waiting, it's, it's waiting for this to happen. It is, and it, it's, a, it's an awesome time. It's a, one, as we talked about at the beginning of this section of what a wonderful thing it is for us to be able to go and keep these feasts. And just to let you viewers know, we do, in the Living Church of God, keep the annual holy days we talked about in the booklet here of God's Master Plan. And the Feast of Tabernacles is something that all of our members around the world attend every year. It isn't that they go if they want to or whatever. It's part of, if you are a part of the Living Church of God, this is what we do because God commands it. And as the meeting planner for the church, it's my job to find and contract the sites in the United States that our members can go to attend. And we have 11 feast sites in the United States of America. We have four in Canada. And when you include all of our sites around the world, we have about 50 different sites around the world where our members are able to come before God and rejoice at this Feast of Tabernacles. And that is what he tells us to do. We don't have the time to get into you know, what, what the Bible tells, but one of the big things that is stressed over and over again when God explained how to keep the feast was that you are to come before him and to rejoice and to learn to fear him. And it is a time of rejoicing, and it's a wonderful experience that each of us can do every single year, mm -hmm. and it's the thing that we look forward to. It's awesome. You know, and, and we, can, we can be a part of it if we want what God wants for us. It's exciting. If I could just break in and just mention real quickly, one of the, or the way we celebrate these feasts is as we go, the Feast of Tabernacles is a seven-day-long festival, and we meet um, generally in the mornings for a morning church service. And on the holy days, we meet twice for these services. There are Bible studies included during this time where we're, you know, we've just spent a little bit of time talking about some of these millennial scriptures today. We spend message after message after message delving into the scripture, digging in, pulling out mm -hmm. the details of the vision of this coming kingdom that God has designed. And he's designed it for all of humanity. God is not willing that any should... Um, perish, but that all should come to repentance and ultimately everlasting life. So this is a time for humanity to be free, to rejoice, to learn God's way of life, to learn to live it. There are billions who don't know about Jesus Christ. Right. They've never been taught. They've never been taught about the law of God, and they're going to be taught how to live this way. And when you live God's way of life, there are inherent blessings in it. That's why it is the law of liberty. It frees you from the shackles right. and the ramifications sin. of sin. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can rejoice in the blessings that come with really obedience to God, but it's not obedience where you're being forced into something. Mm -hmm. 
God you gives you guidelines. To. Once you see that, once, and that's part of it. He'll use Israel as a, as a beacon in a certain way to show. And then the, the other nations, as you read in, in, uh, in Isaiah 2, will want to come find out about it because they'll see how good that way of life is. So, well, gentlemen, it has been a, a wonderful opportunity to talk about uh, the truth, to talk about that future coming kingdom. Of course, you know, we, we've got to talk about the, the, the hard things that are going to come, and we, we have, but uh, to talk about God's coming kingdom, what it will be like, and, and that wonderful future, that wonderful opportunity he gives to every single human being is awesome. I did want to read a quote before we close from Mr. Uh, Mr. Ames's article in our uh, latest uh, um, Tomorrow's World magazine here, and you can see the latest Tomorrow's World magazine, uh, what comes after World War III is the cover article. He says, um, most human beings who survive World War III will come to understand that man's ways lead to death, and they will repent and will come to understand God's love for them. They will realize that Jesus Christ's crucifixion and his shed blood will pay for their sins. It's never too late to understand that. And they will be teachable, and they will learn a new way of life. What an incredible future that we have. We want to thank you for, for joining us. Uh, we, today we've talked about the four horsemen, the four seals associated uh, with that in Revelation 6 and the troubles that are, that are going to be coming, that are going to be getting worse. Um, we do have a, a booklet, uh, 14 Signs. You can, you can get this, 14 Signs Announcing Christ's Return. You can go to our website, type it in. Uh, and we have the, the world ahead with the, for the fifth topic that we've talked about, the world ahead, what it will be like. You can look at that, and again, we, we've given you some other resources you can look at um, you know, as, as you have the opportunity and learn about this way, learn about this beautiful, wonderful future and opportunity. But uh, if I can interrupt, yeah. I'll just say what my dad has said forever. Don't believe me. Believe your Bible. Check us out. That's right. Read the booklets. Read the scriptures that we've talked about today. Prove it for yourself, because we can stand here and say it all day long. It's got to be but proven But if you don't God's prove word. it, yes. it Means it's it's not it's not going to last last for you. That's You've right. You've got to prove it for yourself. You don't do it because somebody else said to. You don't do it because your wife or your sister or your mother or your father said they think it's a good idea. You do it because you believe it and you know this is what God wants you to Proving do. Proving it for ourselves is the, is what allows us to make the changes we need to make to be a part of that incredible future. And when you read it, you might be surprised by what you read. It actually is in there. Right. It yes. is. Uh, well, again, we want to thank everyone for, for joining us today. We want to thank you for that. And, and again, like us and share us. And I'll tell you, you watching this program, it is your part in doing the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom of God, in, in preaching that gospel. You sharing it, that's, what's, that's your part in this gospel and the preaching of it. And that's what Christ is doing through his church. That's what he's, he's been doing. And that's our part in that. We want to thank you, and please join us next Thursday at 3 p.m.